Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon on this warm, beautiful day in Boston. My name is Krzysztof Daniewski, and on behalf of the Harvard Alumni Club of Holland, I would like to welcome all of you to our lecture. I would like to welcome uh, uh, those who are here with us today, as well as those who are watching us online uh, from Poland. The Harvard Club of Poland lecture uh, will take place yearly at Harvard, and its aim will be to increase the visibility of Polish themes and exceptional Polish individuals on campus. The lecture will bring prominent Polish leaders in business, arts, science, and policy to our campus to give a public address and interact with students, faculty, and the broader Harvard community. I am very pleased to welcome our first annual lecture guest speaker, founder of Getting Bank, and one of the most prominent businessmen in Europe, Mr. Leszek Czarnecki. I would like to thank Harvard University Vice Provost Jorge Dominguez, uh, as well as the Center for European Studies, uh, Professor Grzegorz Eckert, uh, and the Center's Executive Director, Tricia Craig, for making this event possible. Without further ado, I would like to ask Lawrence Tisch, Professor of History, Neil Ferguson, to introduce our guest. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure those of you who have uh, run the marathon must be glad to come in uh, and cool off here with us this afternoon. It's a huge uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Leszek uh, Czarnecki, uh, whose career uh, is really quite a remarkable one. Rather than eat up valuable airtime, I will merely give you the, the headlines. And not only is he... Uh, a PhD in economics. He also is one of Poland's and indeed Europe's most successful uh, entrepreneurs. Unusually, he's a diver. And I discovered that he holds the Polish record for deep cave diving, as well as a world record in the amount of distance covered in underground caves. I personally can't think of anything more terrifying <laughs> in the world than cave diving. So I'm already... Uh, no. <laughs> I just did that. And that would be... Cave diving is worse. I'm pretty confident. Um, so he uh, started in business with a leasing firm. He sold that to the uh, bank Credit Agricole in 2001 became the CEO of Credit Agricole in Poland. He's now a shareholder in uh, at least six companies and the chairman of Getin Holding, uh, which has interests all over Central and Eastern Europe. He's currently building Sky Tower, which will be the tallest building in Poland. He's written books, uh, one entitled Simply Business, another Risk in Banking. He also has a talk with the title, How to Make Your First Million. Unfortunately, that's not the talk he's going to give today. So if you were <laughs> hoping, and I know some of my colleagues have been trying to make their first million now for quite some time, that's not the subject of his uh, talk today. Uh, what uh, Dr. Sarneski is going to do is to talk uh, about the global economic crisis, uh, the European crisis, and uh, their impact, or lack of impact, on Poland. So please welcome our distinguished cave diving guest. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, so, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great honor to me to be here, and I'm very pleased to share my ideas and my experience with you. Uh, and it's always the problem how it works. Could somebody help me? Oops. I push all the buttons and it didn't work. Maybe that's the problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's right one? Not really. Okay. Fine. That's fine. So uh, before starting a few words about my personal. 
and myself, although I was introduced uh, so some uh, information about my track record. Uh, I'm a graduated technical university uh, in Poland and during my universities uh, when I was uh, 23. At the same time, I was a diver, a scuba diver instructor as well, a commercial diver, so I created my first company, which was an underwater works company. Uh, actually, company <laughs> did very well, and uh, six years later, at the beginning of the 90s, I sold this company, uh, getting some hundred thousand US, and then I invested all money I get, being at this time, uh, at the age 28, into completely new business, which was a leasing company. Uh, at the same time, I entered university again, did my master and PhD in economics, parallel running company. The company uh, I sold 10 years later to Credit Agricole, based on the quite a, a lot of money, uh, because it was over 400 million euros. And then again, I invested all money into startup, which was uh, getting holding the company I'm still actually in. The company is a financial conglomerate, which uh, covered practically all financial activities uh, in Poland and in Central Europe, including uh, retail banking, insurance, asset management, uh, mortgage banking, as well as private banking. And right now it employed more than 13,000 employees. So that's briefly about me. Now I could say that uh, focusing on the topic of this presentation, Quo Vadis Europe. For those who doesn't know a Latin language, Quo Vadis, it means uh, where are we going, Europe? And this is the question <coughs> which is raised by everybody practically in the world thinking uh, what might be in future if we not consider the uh, Maya calendar at the end of the world this year. Uh, so probably it's not going to happen, so we still have to leave next year. <coughs> so in fact, uh, the question <coughs> which I find the most important is uh, if this, in fact, the end of the economic status that we know, it is the end of globalization, and uh, all the problems we know are coming from the globalization, or at the end of the world, this is the end of democracy. So, in fact, my opinion answers are very easy because it's not the first time the crisis <coughs> we have, and only in last uh, 15 years, at least we noticed three crises, which were the huge one. Maybe not as huge as this one, but they were very, very serious. Uh, the biggest concern is about globalization. Although all of us uh, know the profits coming of globalization and the all goods, uh, entire world could uh, find from globalization. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of problems coming uh, from this, especially in the financial sector. Why not? Why, why is such a problem? It's because globalization plus technology allowed us and allowed uh, global financial institution to launch the product immediately, practically online, uh, in so many places, at this such a big scale, that uh, practically there are no time to, to check it, how it works uh, in the real life, and it's a huge risk to launch a product which later on uh, might create the mess and the disaster like a subprime. Uh, product that you know perfectly. Also, uh, what uh, a lot of economists uh, find out recently, that because there are no time for the serious discussion about 
product uh, most of investors and not only individuals but also institutional one react by emotion not based on the fundamental there are no time for the serious analysis so then also from the other side uh, it must be much higher focus on the behavior economy as we could say in this way than just a microeconomics models as uh, far as the technology as far as globalization and the uh, financial liberalization is concerned I think the mixture of those three factors uh, makes what I say the bill the bills casino which is quite obvious for you and uh, there are so many movies uh, made recently about the behavior of investment bankers uh, from the global banks and uh, so it must be something implemented in this either to slow down the process or uh, to involve some new tools which allows the, all those uh, institutions to check the mm, product they, they launch. And finally, uh, seeing what happened in, uh, especially in Southern Europe, and also comparing the way how, let's say, the China is efficient comparing to the rest of the world, it raised the question, maybe democracy is not the best solution for, mm, for the world. Answer is obviously not. This is still the best system we involve, although uh, there is a big threat that might be, especially uh, in those countries which suffered a lot of the crisis, that it must be uh, might be the huge race of populism and autocracy. So let's focus right now on Europe. The question is, which is raised by everybody, when is it going to finish? But before answering those questions, we have to start seriously discussing where from uh, this crisis came to Europe, which in my opinion is significantly different than in, than in the US. Because uh, US case was or is relatively simple. Uh, financial sector launched a stupid I could say simply stupid products to the market, market accepted, they lost a lot of money, and then almost the whole cycle was about bankruptcy. So it's required a huge bailout program. So I don't want to uh, develop this issue because all of you uh, heard, uh, as you said, uh, tons of information about this. Actually, it's not the case in Europe. Uh, the main problem in Europe are the budget deficits in most of countries, especially in the southern one. Uh, and this budget deficit uh, was increased years by years. So once the crisis 2008-2009 arrived uh, to the U.S. and later on to, to the uh, European countries, uh, and uh, requirements of saving uh, European banks and also launching a huge bilot program in Europe, which was more or less the same scale as the US, only increased problems of the budget deficit in those countries. Uh, in Europe, I could say, but first of all, as I said, that the problem was already existing. So the main fundamental problem in Europe is not the financial system. Although, 
of course, uh, banks has to be changed in the same way as uh, in the U.S., and they have to recover ability to do, uh, I could say, a traditional normal banking business, especially uh, they can't be the banks, as I call them, upfront bank. Upfront bank, in my opinion, is a bank, in, uh, as I call them, is a bank who uh, launched uh, such a product to the market which allowed them to book in the PLN they had the huge income up front. And uh, nobody is really know how about the risk in future coming from this from this product. And there are no provisions for that and uh, all uh, bankers are getting their bonuses coming from this this product. And then might be the problem, may not. Actually we notice some problem with subprimes. So it must be something changed uh, probably in uh, international accounting standards or US GAAP uh, accounting standards. Uh, so once we understand uh, the reason of crisis in, in Europe, so then we relatively easy, of course easy I only mind saying or making presentation, could predict when this crisis might be finished. So first of all, the fundamental problem must be resolved, as you can see on, the, on this page. Uh, the question is, is going to happen and the all uh, countries, uh, especially Greece, Spain, uh, Italy, Portugal, will launch their savings programs and they stop to be very social country. If they be without uh, some protests or revolutions or uh, street fightings that we notice in Greece, uh, they be the reform launch among the European countries, especially about the discipline uh, of mm, members' budget. When it's going to happen, I don't know. Actually, uh, surprisingly, what I have to say, that there is a huge desperation among the European members to launch all those changes uh, into the market in real life. And uh, they are even more succeed with that than I could predict a couple of months ago. And finally, when the politicians uh, uh, would do their job, and the banking sector will change in the way will change in the way we, it is required, and the financial market believe in all those changes. We could think that uh, maybe the crisis will be over. When is going to happen? I have no clue, but rather later than sooner. <coughs> mm. So if we could spend a little bit more time about the uh, roots of current crisis in Europe, uh, as I said, although the main reason uh, was a huge, huge uh, budget deficit, almost in all country members, although the, the largest was uh, in the southern countries. For example, Greece uh, had a 160% uh, debt comparing to the gross domestic product. It's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, if we see uh, the budget deficit, uh, it was unacceptable growth since the beginning. It was a huge uh, deficit for, for, for Greece, and then it was a bilateral But as I said, this 16% uh, uh, budget deficit in real figures is uh, more than 150% the gross domestic product. Uh, also, prices uh, 2008 required, uh, on the one hand, uh, 
huge provisions which all, almost all European banks had to, to make, had to launch, and on the other hand, at the same time, regulators decided to uh, launch a new regulation which is called uh, Basel III. Basel III, for those of you who doesn't know what it is, uh, Basel I uh, was launched uh, in 1974 and it described uh, re capital and liquidity requirements uh, from the banks related to the size. And then was uh, upgraded uh, in the uh, 90s to Basel III and now uh, we are talking about, uh, to Basel II and now we are talking about the Basel III which significantly requires uh, additional equity to uh, all banks. And because of this, that uh, it happened exactly the same time where most of banks notice losses. So obviously, uh, as I said, uh, most of European countries launch uh, their bylaws programs. And uh, a lot of uh, European banks became nationalized fully or partly. And uh, there are only some examples of, of them. And obviously it increased uh, uh, already huge budget deficit. Unfortunately, the access to the equity was very limited because uh, there were no investors, everybody was afraid, and uh, you have a slide uh, showing you how many IPOs were done at the London Stock Exchange and comparing to Poland. Why I uh, show you Poland here, because actually Poland was the only country, and still it is one of the very few countries which uh, uh, avoid crisis. There were no crises in Poland, even in 2008, 2009, although we noticed a significant slowdown of the economy, there were no crises. And uh, the funny thing is that 2008 and 2009, uh, there were more IPOs and the Warsaw than in London, although the market is much, much slower. But it shows you how it's difficult to get the equity. Although uh, Poland was uh, doing uh, pretty well, uh, we made a lot of problems as well, very specific to, to this region. Uh, any, practically any banks in Poland, and also practically very few in other Central European countries, uh, were in infected by toxic acid. But uh, all those countries are not uh, members of Eurozone. Uh, they have their own local currency. And because the uh, cost of uh, capital was much higher nominally in the local currency, so most of credits were given either in uh, Swiss franc or in euros. So once uh, crisis started, it reflects the huge depreciation of local currency. For example, Poland, uh, Polish złoty, Polish currency, against the Swiss franc in September 2008 cost two per one Swiss franc, but four months later it was four złoty. What does it mean for the bank and the customers? So if they had a credit nom nominated in the Swiss franc, immediately within four months, the nominal size increased two times. It still was okay about the credit, surprisingly, uh, in terms of the credit quality, because let's say once, mm, 
interest in credit giving in the Swiss franc was for more or less 3%. In Polish what it was 9%. So even if the size of credit was doubled, it still was cheaper uh, than in local currency. But you could immediately imagine how it impacts on the bank side. Because, for example, in my bank, suddenly, within a month, uh, our credit portfolio increased 40% by a couple of billions US. So it, it meet immediately is required additional equity to meet the regulation. And also, I have to find uh, the way how to finance it. It's required immediately to collect the huge amount of deposits. So obviously, a lot of banks start notice losses. And uh, this is the example of Poland. And uh, third quarter of 2008, there were no bank which report losses among the largest bank in Poland. The last quarter, 2008, we have already eight of them. So out of 30, so more than 25% banks noticed lot losses. Fortunately, uh, the last quarter when we saw losses in Poland was the end of 2010. So within the crisis, which uh, again hit the Europe in the middle of last year, was relatively ignored by the Polish financial sector. At the same time, uh, the process happened the same as the US. So in Poland, the uh, process of consolidation started. There are only examples uh, of the banks, uh, how many of them? 12, actually, out of the top 30, which were either sold or for sale. And uh, actually, two of them were uh, taken over by, by my bank. So we, buy, we bought a GMAC Bank and Allianz Bank and applied for some others. So uh, that runs us to the question, how successfully run the business during such an uncertain time? Uh, because uh, it's something completely new for most of managers, for most of entrepreneurs. So certainly the perspective of doing business is much, much shorter than it used to be. And because of uh, no access to the equity and because of the cost of uh, capital, the cost of financing uh, increased significantly, so most of businesses uh, has to avoid uh, leverage. And uh, also, very important thing at the very end, in my opinion, should be focused on. So I actually uh, developed the theory, uh, which is actually the topic one of my book, about the entropy uh, of company. For those of you who doesn't know what the entropy is, entropy is a uh, information coming, uh, it's a data coming from the uh, thermodynamic theory, which is saying that uh, any machine, uh, no, it's saying about the how uh, the system is organized, I could say, in this way. So in other words, uh, if entropy is higher, it means that chaos is uh, bigger. If entropy is lower, it means that uh, everything is in order. Directly from the theory of entropy is uh, coming uh, uh, the uh, story about perpetuum mobile, the machine, who is unable to work without the energy. If we convert such a theory into the company, I'm saying that without the energy given to the company, the company must increase the cost. 
and it's extremely, extremely important. And what kind of energy we could give into the company? Either this is equity, which is the easiest one, but even the most important is the energy given by people to the company. So if you forget the company and you try to, to do it standalone, later or sooner the company starts to doing very, very bad. And also uh, the crisis uh, ruin the trust in leaders, in institutions, in the companies, in brands. So I strongly believe that what we have to do is to rebuild this trust. And uh, I believe it's, it's crucial to be proud of the company you are working in and also it's crucial to make your customers be proud of being these customers. So a uh, few words how I run my business uh, during this uncertain time, which actually wasn't very easy. So I launch, uh, no, I meet the crisis uh, in such a my own situation. First of all, I deeply involved in the banking business. I launched the uh, bonds program, which expired the beginning of 2009, almost a billion US has to be repaid. Then I heavily depends on the uh, Swiss franc credit portfolio that uh, hit very much my capital and equity requirements. And also, just a couple of years earlier, you know, I got an idea to make some sort of diversification my assets because I was uh, wondering how if it's uh, having everything in the banking business is a safe strategy. So I started uh, on the side my real estate business, a quite a big one. So at the beginning of 2008, we ran a couple of projects. Uh, about 5,000 condominiums were under construction couple of offices, project as well. And then I met the crisis, which unfortunately hit the most two businesses, real estate and banking. <laughs> <laughs> so that was about the strategy of diversification. <laughs> and uh, also, obviously, a new uh, regulation, new capital uh, uh, requirements, uh, no li new liquidity requirements. Oh, it was a mess. <laughs> and additionally, uh, obviously, the cost of funding increase. Uh, you know all this graph, so it's not needed to, to spend more time about that. Uh, that's exactly what, what I said. That hit me, hit me very, very much. And what was even more interesting that, uh, that I didn't mention before, that uh, having a Euro or, Swa or uh, Credit Suisse nominated credit, and it was exactly the same in practically all banks, uh, not only in Poland, but uh, uh, in Central Europe, same in Czech, Slovakia, uh, Hungary suffered a lot, even much, much more than, than Poland, and also Pribaltica. Uh, that having a credit in Swiss franc, and once a Swiss franc appreciates so strong against a Polish water or other Central Europe's currency. So first of all, as I said, it's required additional equity immediately. Uh, then how in practice was done that we were able to give in a credit in a Swiss franc because according to the banking law, uh, we have to match liabilities with assets also in terms of the currency. So once I uh, give a Swiss franc nominated credit, I have to take a deposit as well. 
uh, nominated in the same currency. But where from could they take a, a Swiss franc in Poland? Why everybody putting their money in the Polish złoty? So I took the Polish złoty deposit and exchanged them with the country partner, let's say in London City, here in New York, or in others uh, financial center, uh, to Swiss franc through the swap of Swiss transactions. And once a crisis arrived, and it was very easy and a cheap transaction, it's not a very cost, on the, the most liquid market, which is a capital market. But nobody predicts that once crisis arrived, this market simply disappeared. Nobody would like to do such a transaction. And uh, nobody cares that I have Zwoty, Polish Zwoty, or somebody has in uh, Hungary, Hungarian foreign, and would like to exchange them into Swiss franc. Nobody cares. There were no counterparty. But according to the Polish, uh, to the banking law, once you have an open position, open it means that you're not uh, hatched in terms of the same currency, immediately you have to do provision for that, which means that next day you have to announce bankruptcy. And uh, unfortunately, in my case, additionally to those information, uh, at the end of 2008, I had to roll as much as three billion Swiss franc, and there were no market for that. And also, additional to this slide, uh, out of this uh, couple of thousand condominiums I had under construction, and uh, most of them were pre-selled already at the same all, almost all office space where under construction was pre-leased already. So practically all those um, agreements were canceled. And obviously, it broke all the covenants to the bank, so the banks wanted immediately to pay back the credit. So to get the full picture. So it wasn't very, very easy. Uh, but fortunately, there were some banks which still were doing uh, uh, swaps transaction, and we were able to find a Swiss franc but against the Polish Zwoty, but the problem was the duration of uh, borrowing money was at that time three days. So we don't know what happened in the next three days. So in the next three days, we borrow for the next three days, uh, and then for the next three days. And uh, so finally, we have a relief uh, like a February or the end of January 2009, where we were able to get a seven days money. After February, uh, in March, I probably announced to my people that probably the crisis is over because we are able to find one month's money against the 30 years mortgage credit. <laughs> uh, at the same time, we had to stop uh, all businesses uh, in real estate are frozen. Uh, at least for three years, uh, most of credits uh, which was uh, asked by the bank to pay back, I had to pay from my own pocket. I support, supported my, my company. And fortunately, uh, everything started to normalize and uh, so we, yeah, there are some other problems. This is the structure of my company just before crisis. Uh, yeah, as I said, we froze an all developers program. But finally, uh, after some actions, we launched, we sold some assets, we uh, stopped some project. I could say that right now the company almost uh, recovered the value, 
But immediately, once I announced, as I said, in 2009, uh, that probably the crisis is over, uh, because we are able to, uh, to find a one month and very soon three months money. So we immediately start to develop the business and we start to be extremely aggressive in terms of acquisition of new startups. And uh, in 2009 and the 2010, we bought five banks and uh, we create uh, as much as 4,000 uh, uh, new working place. So uh, actually, at the end of the day, the company doubled the size. And uh, 2011, we finished with the profit 330 million US, and we almost recovered our market cap before the crisis. So this is very briefly about the story in Europe. And the very end, I would like to say that I strongly believe that the crisis be, be over. And I strongly believe looking uh, what happened in Europe, and I'm actually very positively surprised how much New European politicians are desperate to finally finish this crisis. So probably it takes some time. I don't know if uh, it's finished at uh, 2013, quite likely, I love to. It may be slightly longer, but finally, I strongly believe that first of all, European Union survive. And also, I strongly believe, and I'm in Euro, and I'm strongly supporter uh, of the Eurozone, I strongly believe that the uh, Euro survive as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, fascinating uh, discussion of both the macroeconomic and microeconomic uh, aspects of the crisis. I'm going to uh, begin by asking a few questions and then open it up to the floor. Uh, now that I'm audible, I hope I don't have to say all that again. Uh, uh, let me begin by, by asking a question about uh, Poland's experience in the crisis. On our way downstairs, uh, as we chatted in the uh, elevator, you said there wasn't really a crisis in Poland. Uh, and I've heard similar things said by uh, people in the Polish government, including my old friend Radek Sikorski, the foreign minister. And yet the story that you just told us... Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the story, <laughs> the story you just told us sounds somewhat at odds with that account, since you showed us a decline, marked decline in IPOs, you showed a, an increase in bank losses, uh, you described a real estate crisis, and most strikingly of all, I think you just told us about your own near-death experience uh, <laughs> as a bank. So if there was no crisis in Poland, how are we to understand these various symptoms of what sounds like the familiar uh, story of a crisis? First of all, I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> and uh, although I showed you the number of banks with losses, but on the other hand, actually Poland uh, is very proud that uh, uh, we didn't notice even a single bank bankruptcy. None of the bank was bankrupt. So they are able to, to recover it uh, relatively uh, fast as you could, as you could notice. Uh, it was much worse uh, in the real estate industry, there are a couple of companies that were bankrupt, but still, uh, as far as I know, none of the serious player bankrupt. So uh, either medium-sized developers or the small one were bankrupt. And uh, finally, in 2007, 
Poland noticed almost 5% growth of GDP. It was 4% in 4.1 or 4.2, as far as I remember, in 2008, because, in fact, crisis, crisis started in the last quarter of 2008, so it takes a time to impact the industry. But in 2009, it was only 1.9. So the industry and the whole economy significantly slowed down, but still was positive. So based on the definition, once we understand the crisis are uh, two uh, quarters in a row with the uh, negative GDP. We didn't notice anything like that in Poland, so that's why we're saying there were no crisis. But it was extremely difficult time. Uh, from my 27 years uh, experience being <coughs> entrepreneur, the last quarter of 2008 sounds like a nightmare. I, I barely remember if I had the night this time that I slept more than four hours for a couple of months. Can I follow that up with a question <laughs> about Poland and Europe? In your account, the crisis in Europe was in part a sovereign debt crisis, in part a banking crisis. But if I remember one of your early slides, fundamentally an institutional crisis arising from the imperfect nature of European integration, monetary integration without other kinds of, of integration. You concluded by saying you're a believer in the Euro and in the Eurozone. Do you believe that Poland should be in the Eurozone? It would certainly have reduced your difficulties a little bit if you hadn't had liabilities in Euros or Swiss francs and assets in, in Zloty. So what's your sense of the future of, of Poland's uh, currency? Should, should Poland join the euro? So uh, I understand there are two questions here. First of all, uh, how is the impact uh, to the whole European question, uh, to the whole European Union coming from having a common currency? And then the second one, how about Poland? in this context. So do I understand correctly? Yes. So answering the first question, uh, although uh, euro as a common currency is not a perfect tool, and it has a lot of uh, mistakes. First of all, the main mistake is that once a Euro was launched, uh, it wasn't supported by the very strong uh, central bank, which is like in, in the US, uh, where dollar is strongly supported by Fed. The second mistake was done is that uh, it was a common understanding in Europe that once uh, we start to integrate Europe, we have to support uh, some uh, underdeveloped parts of Europe and uh, help them to catch the at least the average. Uh, and those money were given practically without any conditions. So uh, mostly southern countries, they taken it for free and. Uh, they became a heavy spenders. So it's obviously, it's ruin uh, willingness and ability to the hard work and uh, efficiency. Uh, the question is, and a lot, there are a lot of uh, people arguing that right now, either uh, some countries should uh, leave the Eurozone or more of uh, uh, being more radical, they are arguing that even the euro should be cancelled and uh, uh, France should uh, go back to the uh, French franc and uh, Germans should launch again a uh, Deutschmark. I, I think that uh, 
this situation could be easily described, and this is the best answer but such an example. Mm. In the beginning of 90s, uh, people start producing uh, cars. At that time, it was some symptom of luxury. Uh, very few people could afford uh, having a car. But uh, due to globalization and standardized of way of producing an engine, clutches, brakes, uh, actually, I don't know if you know, there are only very few uh, producers of all those things, and in most <coughs> cars, in fact, they're the same engines, the same brakes, the same clutches. Cars became relatively cheap, and it's not a big deal having a car. So obviously the traffic increased, but the positive influence of having a car for the whole industry is obvious. But let's assume that uh, suddenly uh, the numbers of accidents, car accidents increased. There are a lot of victims. There are a lot of dead people because actually the standardized brake which is a launch in every this car, it's probably not worked perfectly. And then, because of the scale of those victims and because of some uh, insurance company became a bankruptcy, hmm, that became a, a serious problem. And some specialists are claiming about the solution. The solution is, no, no, the standardized uh, break is not a good solution. We have to uh, go back to the beginning of 19th century solution because at that time there were no such a uh, big numbers of the car accident. And the more radical, they're saying, uh, no, 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 it's better solution. Stop producing cars. There'd be no accidents. So I don't know it's a best solution. And exactly the same is with Euro. So the old problems in Europe are not coming from uh, having a common uh, currency, but first of all, because of the budget deficit. Uh, all those problems were existing already before Euro came. Euro only speed up the process. Uh, but there are so many things positive coming from, at the same time, from having uh, <coughs> uh, the same common currency. There's a huge market which helps a lot Europe to compete in the entire world with the US, with the China, that answering your second question. I'd be very happy to see Poland in Eurozone as soon as possible. Well, that, that strikes me as a, a remarkable uh, answer when I think most economists on this side of the Atlantic, at this university, I can think of Ken Rogoff and Marty Feldstein, uh, would say, you've got this quite wrong. It was the creation of a single currency that made the budget deficits a problem because it removed from the peripheral economies the option to devalue. And if Poland were to join the Eurozone, it would find itself in precisely the position that those peripheral economies were in uh, in 2009 until now, uh, unless by some miracle Polish workers became as productive as, as German workers. Isn't one reason that Poland's crisis was less severe than the crisis in, say, Greece or Portugal or Spain precisely that you were not in the Eurozone? Yes and no. Obviously, for the short-term perspective, not being in uh, Eurozone helps a lot to follow. But actually, uh, Poland is the less developed country in the region based on the one condition. Uh, the influence of export in our country right now it's about 40% uh, of all our GDP. 
which is the lowest one, uh, compared to the pre balticus countries, uh, where it's about 80%, or to Czech or Hungary, where it's about 60. So 40% looks very miserable. Once crisis arrive, actually most countries stop importing goods. All of them start to protect the domestic market. And because Poland was less depending on export, so we didn't suffer very much. And it's nothing to do with Euro. Again, uh, once we were a member of European Union, uh, we were titled to receive a huge uh, stream of money. We were heavily subsidized by European Union as much as, as far as I know, about 12 billion euro every month, so every year. So it's about the 15 billion or even more US dollar every year. And those, uh, and those money coming from uh, Brussels and those money also were given to Poland in 2008, 2009. So it is huge amount of money which helped us a lot to survive crisis. And it's nothing to do again with Euro or even it's actually very much related to Euro because once we decided to join uh, European Union, we agree to be a part of the uh, Eurozone. Uh, and last but, but not least, uh, I think that uh, being a part of the huge market, there is no question from the business standpoint of view perspective. It helps a lot to get a big, bigger scale of activity. It helps a lot to create a bigger and much more efficient company. And it's impossible to create a huge market without the same currency. So for the time being, for the couple of years, Probab not, not probable, for sure. Uh, it's much easier to manage the crisis having a uh, join uh, um, their own currency. But in the longer term perspective, definitely uh, common market is a very good solution. And I, I strongly would like to be in. Well, thank you very much. I could press you further than that, but I've asked quite enough questions. And it's now time to open uh, the discussion to the floor. Can I ask if you uh, do have a question, raise your hand. And when I uh, call on you, uh, not sure that we are using a roving microphone. The ceiling microphones. Uh, so your every word will be recorded. Please identify yourself. Uh, and ask a question. I'm strongly opposed to long rambling statements, and I'll just interrupt you and mm -hmm. cut you off because I'm from Glasgow and I don't mind being rude. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> there is no microphone. There are microphones in the ceiling, so uh, you don't need to worry about it. But just tell us who you are and tell us your question. Uh, Andrzej Nowajewski, I'm from physics departments at Harvard. Um, I have two questions. One, you mentioned the, the um, money inflow from the European Union subsidies and infrastructure investments that helped Poland avoid the recession. But Poland is not going to receive that money forever. So my first question is, um, how much more fragile do we think Polish economy is going to become in the near future because of that? And the second question more about long-term Polish um, uh, economic future. Obviously, you're, you're invested in um, in, in Poland, the majority of your assets are in Poland long term. So what do you think is going to happen um, to the structure of the Polish economy when um, Polish workers are not going to be able to compete with China and other countries in manufacturing? And do you think it's going to be possible to move on to high-tech innovation or science-based uh, economy, given what is going on these days? Yeah, so first question be easier to answer. <laughs> and the second, actually, the problem is that I lost my uh, glass ball, so uh, it will be difficult to look into it. <laughs> uh, so the truth is that Polish, uh, Poland is heavily uh, supported by the European Union uh, till the end of the year 2014. So, uh, uh, the stream of uh, money is agreed 
uh, uh, for the next two years. Right now, uh, as you probably uh, may chance to, to notice, uh, the new budget is negotiated uh, for next, uh, I don't know, either for eight years or 12 years, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, it's a quite uh, uh, long perspective. And although probably Poland wouldn't be able to get as much money as we are getting right now, but still there'd be quite significant amount of money. Uh, and the question is, what happened then? So there's a common understanding that after the next, let's say, 10 years, Poland be able to compete uh, independently with uh, most uh, global players. But doesn't include China. I don't know, so probably the better solution is to look at how Americans resolve these problems and then do the same. <laughs> but uh, probably once uh, China Yuan is heavily undervaluated and is heavily supported in a not really fair way by the Chinese government, that'd be very, very difficult to, to catch them. Although, uh, again, I strongly believe that'd be much easier to compete with China and, let's say, with all BRICS countries being uh, one common market in Europe than to act independently. That's uh, I strongly believe. And the part of being a common market is a common currency. Yes, sir. My name is Brian Jansen. I'm a private consultant, and I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Konevsky, uh, for your very stimulating talk and sharing with us uh, your obviously very successful business philosophy. In that context, I have two questions. Uh, on one of the slides, you showed um, the theme, think local, act local, and allocate resources globally. Um, the first two things, I think, are very obvious and uh, uh, not necessary. Most of things is think global, act local, or so. No, but but uh, given given the disasters, uh, for example, uh, banks in Iceland had experience who became overnight global players and failed terribly. But what do you mean by allocating resources globally in this context? Could you give an example? <coughs> My second question is, uh, fight entropy in your company. Uh, could you give an example, a practical example? When I, when I look at your company, you diversify. This is, in some, to some extent, synonymous to increasing entropy. Mm -hmm. How do you solve this, Nadra? So, uh, answering the question, I I suppose I had a book, uh, my own one, <laughs> about the entropy. So like uh, the movie with uh, Gordon Gecko. So answering your question cost ten dollars, but you could buy it on uh, eBay <laughs> and the Amazon. Uh, that's about the entropy. <laughs> this is my book. Uh, but uh, seriously uh, speaking. Uh, Mm, the words are uh, think locally, act locally, but uh, mm, try to invest globally. Uh, what I mean here is in the opposite of the most strategies launched by global players, who in most cases uh, try to launch a global strategy, more or less the same in every country, but using local managers that I not really agree with such a strategy, having in mind all differences in all countries. So think locally, 
act locally. It means for me uh, be very patient and be very careful and be very focusing on local conditions. And uh, for example, uh, actually in my group I have a bank in actually two banks in Poland, a bank in Russia, a bank in Ukraine, and a bank in, in Russia. And uh, although we try to launch some standardized model in all of them, but practically none of them is comparable. Uh, what we wanted to do is, let's say, to have the best franchise at the local market, not necessary uh, the same as we we have in another. We are very very uh, uh, much considering the opinion coming from the local managers. And for example, in Russia, where we employ the uh, employ about a thousand people, there are no person from Poland. All of them are Russians. In Ukraine, where we have uh, about the six hundred people in our bank. There are only two people from Poland, and only for the time being, they just uh, long, uh, doing some uh, project and they be probably in next two, three years back. And in uh, Bielorussia, where we have uh, 400 people, there's only one guy from Poland. So it's really thinking and acting locally. Uh, but why are thinking uh, about uh, doing business globally? But once I would like, uh, it doesn't mean that we should focus only on the local market. I would like to expand my business globally. Why not? It's always diversification, but still uh, having in mind the local condition. About the entropy, actually, it's a topic for another long one presentation. And I'm seriously, spoke that this is a whole book I wrote about this. Uh, I uh, identified a couple of huge risk factors uh, in the banking business which increase entropy. In other words, increase chaos <coughs> in the uh, mm, banking industry or just in the banking entity which are, uh, among others, the speed of growth. So obviously, if the bank is growing very fast, uh, it's always increased the cost in the bank. It's uh, also the speed of exchanging uh, balance sheet positions. So if, the, in other words, if the bank is doing a lot of the transactions, uh, mostly on the online way, even if it doesn't increase the size of the bank. But because of the numbers of them, it increased the chaos, which means increased entropy. And finally, if it's uh, very active on the FX market, so it's dealing with the uh, currencies, so it's also increased significantly entropy. So I identified those three factors as the most important. Uh, and on the other hand, I identified three factors which significantly improve the uh, situation in the bank, which means reduce entropy and reduce chaos. And first of all, the most important, which is uh, something completely different than regulators are saying, it's not an equity. Uh, first of all, is the quality of staff and uh, quality of managers, the experience, the responsibility, the honesty. Uh, so this is the most important. And I could easily imagine the bank which uh, has the uh, capital adequacy ratio, 100%, which is according to the current regulation, the old one and the newest one, Basel III, uh, is... Uh, recognize that the most safest bank it could be because uh, everything is given from equity. And I could easily uh, imagine the situation that with this bank be bankrupt. That's uh, enough if the board decided to give some stupid uh, credits and they are not be paid and bank be bankrupt. And uh, it doesn't really 
uh, make any difference if the money in bank are coming from deposit, from the market, or from the shareholders. So the most important for me is the quality of the stuff, and uh, if this quality uh, became better and better, obviously it's additional energy given to the, to the company, to the bank, which reduce the cost. The next one is supporting coming from the technology. And finally, last but not least, yes, it is the equity anyway, but only as the last tranche of defense against the cows, not, not but the first one and the most, the most important. So I don't know if it's answering your, your question. <laughs> Yes, but uh, I'm seriously saying that uh, it's a huge, huge uh, subject to discuss that I love to spend an hour so of this. <laughs> we have a question back there. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, getting holding act much more like a private equity, I could say, in this way, or than uh, venture capital. Although we could say that uh, it also could be recognized by uh, as a venture capital. Why so? To better understanding what I have in mind, I have to uh, go back to the beginning of uh, getting holding company and the concept of this business. As I said, once I sold uh, my leasing company uh, 10 years ago, I wanted to start a new business. Especially, I wanted to be again in the financial sector. But even having a uh, hundred million of euro uh, although it's a huge amount of money, it's not big enough to create a serious uh, banking business, which be a leading uh, business not only in Europe, but not only in Poland, but let's say in the Central Europe. It's much, much more required. So it comes me to the conclusion to find a way how could I make it still keeping a control of my business? So it means that also the simplest way that's looking at the money from the, I don't know, a private equity on the stock exchange was very limited because I wanted to keep a control of my company. So how I could make it? According to the theory, uh, I just briefly explained a couple of minutes ago, for me the key issue of getting success of people, which is actually nothing new, it's, it's obvious. But the question is how to attract the very best people from the industry, especially from banking, if you just have any money for that. It's not easy. Uh, I mean the guys, let's say, who are members of the board who are getting millions per year, and I'm not willing to pay them as much because, anyway, I have to meet the regulation expectation to have uh, equity for setting a bank. The bank I have right now is the fifth largest bank in Poland at 22 billion uh, US asset. So it obviously has a, a lot of equity. So there are no space to give a lot of money for, for bonuses. So what I did, uh, I created the concept to do some sort of joint venture with the, uh, the very best managers, offering them to create the startups, uh, which be fully financed by me, and I offer them in case they meet uh, the, uh, the expectation, once they meet the uh, business plan, let's say 30, 40% of the stake. Uh, and they love it. You know what, uh, within the first two years, I was able to collect, I don't know, maybe 20, maybe 
even more the very best managers from the top uh, worldwide uh, global banks in Poland, including a CEOs, they gave up the jobs. They don't want to get uh, any more two, three million dollars a year. They agreed to work for three years for free, just for the stake. And uh, most of them won. Uh, Christoph Kuda uh, confirmed uh, this issue. The company created uh, uh, as much as right now maybe 15 multi-multi-millionaires. <laughs> and, and they love this concept. Uh, so I, I had only two requests at the beginning. First of all, the guy that I approached with this idea has to prove by his track record that he's really successful managers. And uh, he really could show his leadership so he could easily collect the money who stand by him in his project and the ideas of his project because actually I hadn't any idea of doing something specific. So people are coming to me and they're saying, you know, I'm doing such a big bu such a business already so I would like to repeat the same but my own. So all the concept has to be somehow related to the financial sectors because I would like later on to create a lot of synergies uh, among those companies. Some of them later on I did uh, IPO, that's why already I have uh, seven listed companies uh, on the various stock exchanges. Uh, but uh, from this standpoint of view I could say that uh, all my companies so one big either venture capital or private equity concept. So I hope that's answering your question. Yes, your, your neighbor. Um, hello, my name is Pablo Jimok. I am an alumnus of Harvard College and now I'm pursuing a PhD degree in engineering at MIT. And uh, I'd like to ask you why you chose to pursue a PhD degree and what do you think its value is in a business setting? And also, whether you have any advice on how to get the most out of one's graduate study? <laughs> you know what? Um, when I uh, passed my PhD, it was uh, 1993, uh, 19 years ago. Actually, I was very proud of it. And uh, I, I suppose it's a... Uh, uh, it was a great asset, but uh, four years ago I changed my mind very much because actually I applied to do a PhD here in Harvard Business School and I wasn't accepted because they said that I have already a PhD and there are no places to do the second one. So if I haven't this, so probably I'd be accepted. Uh, but seriously, uh, actually this is, uh, I could say, uh, maybe not necessarily required in, in a business. Uh, but uh, because uh, already uh, since my universities, I always uh, liked very much to, to teach. And, uh, and I always thinking to, to stay in university, but uh, I had some problem with the salaries they paid. <laughs> and then uh, it didn't change a lot since then, as far as I know. Uh, but uh, I really like it, so I treat it much more like a hobby. Uh, and uh, it's just a pleasure, like a diving. <laughs> be very honest, but uh, I can't see any big correlation uh, between uh, having a PhD and uh, uh, having a success in, in a business. And uh, most of, maybe not most, a lot of extremely successful uh, businessmen like uh, Steve Jobs, like uh, Bill Gates, like uh, Paul Allen, uh, or uh, earlier, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, they 
had they haven't or hadn't even their masters, although all of them are unquestionable icon of business. On the other hand, we have two professors who were mm, managers of LTCM, long-term capital management, who were uh, Nobel Award and uh, prize. And uh, two years later, after they get the Nobel Prize Award, uh, this uh, long-term capital management company became bankrupt. Unfortunately, uh, not of because of the uh, big mistakes, I could say, uh, mostly because of bad luck. But anyway, it happened. <laughs> uh, so I can't see a very strong uh, correlation. And in my case, uh, as I said, uh, I, I like uh, teaching. I like uh, read and write a lot. I, right now, I complete my next book to be issued next month about the uh, M&A transaction. And um, so uh, it's a great pleasure. Can we ask what the subject of your PhD dissertation was? Uh, the subject was uh, creating the uh, information system, not exactly IT system, but the way how the information, the competence uh, should be given in the retail, uh, uh, maybe not retail, consumer finance company based on the example of my leasing company. So there you are. Don't go into business. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed Professor Mayer raising a hand, and then I'll come over to this side of the, the room in a moment. Professor Mayer. about your sector, which is banking, financial services, and the like. If you were looking ahead and you were called as economics minister in Poland, what type of industrial strategy or what should Poland be, should Poland be profiling itself in a particular uh, you know, econ set of economic sectors uh, given, given, given Europe, the neighbor, uh, the fact that you've got uh, major exporters of industrial goods right nearby, et cetera. So I'm just curious as to, besides banking, what, what Poland should be you know, producing in a certain sense to continue its, its viability? Yeah, to be very honest, I can't even imagine me being a politician. So I have no clue what should I advise. I never do that. Uh, but uh, there are many countries in Europe that uh, we barely could uh, mm, thinking about the icon and global brands they have. So uh, in terms of Poland, uh, probably uh, we should count very much on the small and medium-sized companies. And this sector should be supported as much as possible and then help this, this business growth simply. On the other hand, uh, probably the chance, which is not uh, utilized enough in Poland, is uh, mm, the chance to be in some way, somehow, uh, a bridge between a Russian uh, Russia and the post-Soviet countries because, first of all, Poles understand very well the culture. Most of Poles speak fluently Russian. And uh, more or less, we have the same background coming from the communist time. Uh, so probably uh, that might be a good idea somehow try to uh, to utilize this opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the case, and for last 20 years, uh, the business done between Poland and the East is very, very limited. Uh, 
So that's uh, that's mainly this, uh, and more uh, probably being uh, responsible for the Polish industry or uh, for the Polish budget, because this is much more the work of being a Minister of Finance. Uh, probably I try to simplify it as much as possible. Uh, the old legal and tax environment we have in Poland, which is a mess, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. S and uh, there are some researchers and uh, some scientists claims that uh, uh, we could have uh, at least doubled gross domestic product, uh, which is topped by uh, bureaucracy, uh, which is some cases tremendous. One. So probably here is the largest room for improvement. There are some questions over here. Yes, uh, from the gentleman in the suit. Uh, we have this opportunity to ask a practitioner, a successful practitioner, so it would be grateful to know your advice. What are your prospects for Poland? What, what your opinion about Poland's prospects in coming years? And what should Poland do to generate some own brands, recognized international brands? Because we're growing based on domestic markets as a supplier for other stronger economies. But maybe it will be time, good time for thinking about our own companies. And um, maybe that's time to, to think about some mergers and acquisitions abroad. And when do you think that um, the, the, or, if gen, or, or if it could happen that Polish companies would start to invest abroad, and if this is a like, if this is a likelihood for coming decades or or each itself. So I could say right now, Poland might be compared to Spain. Uh, from the beginning of 90s in terms of the size of the industry. And I strongly believe that uh, when finally European crisis finished, uh, probably we'll meet at least a decade of significant growth in Poland, uh, which also happened in Spain. And in fact, uh, at the end of 90s, uh, I mean, a couple of years later, Spain get the status that uh, uh, they have already, uh, forgetting about the current problems. Uh, uh, so probably within the next 10 years, we could see some uh, global brands coming from Poland, like, for example, Zara is, or another Spain companies. Uh, but uh, I'm not so sure uh, that uh, raising such a topic that uh, we as a Poles, we are desperate to have a global brand is a good, uh, good way to develop the business. Certainly not, and I'm strongly disbelieve in any business which is uh, strongly supported by the government. Now, what the government should do uh, is just to create a friendly nature, friendly opportunity for everybody, which means, as I said before, uh, very friendly bureaucracy, very easy to understand law, relatively low taxes, and so on. And then it's only uh, one thing for the polls should do, is just wait. Success will come for sure. And also, uh, there's one thing that I forgot also answering your question, extremely important, is to put as much attention as possible for good education. So this is the best investment which could be done. So let's do uh, either Harvard, which would be rather difficult to arrange in Poland, so if not, let's send as much as possible Polish young people 
to good universities worldwide. But not on PhD programs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been Why rather. Not? Actually, PhD, when the people complete their PhD, they be good, perfect teachers. Let's see a diplomatic question from, <laughs> uh, from a non Polish source. British diplomat. I wanted to pick up on uh, Professor Ferguson's line of inquiry. Um, listening to you there, it really sounds that Poland is benefiting from its EU membership, particularly membership no doubt. of the single sure. market, um, able to trade within the single market, receiving the structural funds, cohesion funds, which are part of the single market, less so necessarily than, say, Spain within the single currency. I just wanted, looking forwards, if you need this decade of growth, and Europe seems to be at that tipping point. What should we as Europeans be thinking about as our next project? Should it be perhaps more liberalization through the single market that will give us the growth, perhaps the EU-US free trade agreement to link Europe's single market with America's single market? Or do you think there's some sort of institutional project that we should be doing with the European Parliament or perhaps more tinkering with our single currency experiment? Uh, wow, uh, a lot of questions you raised. So first of all, uh, the truth is, is uh, uh, Poland uh, received a lot from Brussels, no doubt. But uh, why I mentioned before Spain, because it was exactly the case with Spain. Spain in the 90s was heavily subsidized uh, by the uh, European Union, and it helped a lot to, to growth in this country and to, to develop Spain. And, uh, I don't know exactly, but somewhere uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, last decade, they stopped the uh, beneficiary, or they still are beneficiary even from European Union, but uh, much less than they used to. So it's quite likely the same perspective ahead of Poland. So at least, as I said, I strongly believe that uh, at least next decade be very fortunate to us. But how about, uh, it's a very general question about the union in future. Uh, I answering uh, in this way, that uh, once we look back into US history, uh, the central bank was established, uh, as far as I know, more than 100 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. And the most of institutions uh, were formed after a long, long period once the United States was formed. In Europe, everything is done much faster. So it obviously, it reflects a lot of mistakes we do. So probably what we should do, just uh, slow down a little bit with developing car uh, European Union as the entity and improve this concept and then start to thinking what next. What doesn't mean slow down? Probably for the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, it should be done nothing. But only for the time being. That's a radical suggestion <laughs> hitherto unheard of in Brussels. Uh, <laughs> Well, the principle is always that something must be done. This is something, so let's do it. I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, I'm going to go there because uh, <laughs> there's been something of a gender bias in the questioning uh, this evening. Well, uh, I was happy to uh, take up that role. Uh, my name is Patrice Zabrowski. I'm one of those PhDs who has a degree in history. I'm also a PhD in history of all things, so it's not one of the ones that you are probably going to encourage Poles <laughs> into. And in that context, I wanted to bring up the idea, which I, I see is very nice here. Uh, once upon a time in history, there was a term that was bandied around about Poland. It was called Polnische Wirtschaft, and it was not a compliment. The idea that Polish economy and economic development was bad was, uh, was, 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 was sort of the standard fare. So it's lovely to see uh, uh, the idea of Polish entrepreneurial spirit here and the idea of Polish economic exceptionalism, and I guess that's what mostly my question for you would be about. Um, uh, one thing, I just had a question regarding one of the slides you showed, because I saw that you do indeed invest in the East, and I thought that would be a logical place for Poles to expand, yeah. although we realize that it 
not always easy to do even now. Um, but uh, it seemed to me, if I'm not mistaken, this may be following slides, and I'm not an uh, economic historian, uh, that uh, during the crisis, you seem to be moving, uh, expanding more to the West. Uh, would you say that you know you were, uh, uh, or is that is just is just my my perception of things that you? Uh, mm, not really. Okay, so that was a misperception. Uh, what then would you inter uh, uh, attribute perhaps some of this Polish entrepreneurial spirit to? And would you perhaps say that some of the Polish uh, economic exceptionalism now is, is systemic? Uh, is it positional again vis-a-vis -vis Poland between East and West? Uh, again, entrepreneurial, or is it perhaps just the luck of also having a consumer-driven economy that seems to be oblivious to the fact that the rest of the world is not buying and Poles are going out and actually shopping and doing things in a sort of, sort of normal fashion? So first of all, uh, you are absolutely right that the Poles are, are heavy spenders. And uh, uh, actually, I was so surprised uh, having some... Uh, shopping malls inside our group uh, that in 2009 uh, there were no slowdown. It's amazing. <clears throat> Traffic was growing every month, 2009, 2010. So that's uh, the way how uh, Poles are spending their money. So obviously it helps a lot. Uh, I think it might be some exceptions uh, uh, as far as Polish entrepreneurs are concerned. Not necessarily only uh, Poles, uh, maybe I could say all Central Europe, but uh, probably Poles the most. Uh, we have to remember that uh, we used to live uh, almost five decades under the communist system. Uh, what does not mean, uh, and what did it mean, that everybody at that time, and uh, even I was child at the time, but I remember it perfectly, that every entire person has to have some entrepreneur skillness because my parents has to, had to arrange everything and it was very similar to, to being an uh, entrepreneur. So uh, they, at that time, everybody in Poland has to react immediately, has to be extremely ready for changes. Rules would change every day. Uh, supply any goods was a really challenge. Uh, being better than the other people competing for those goods was absolutely required. And uh, come on, this is absolutely what we are looking uh, into entrepreneur skills. So that that's helps a lot. And there is a well, very interesting answer. I, I don't know, was it the prime minister of Estonia or Lithuania? It was some of Pribaltica's countries. Uh, probably it was Estonia, which noticed that 16% minus GDP in 2009. Huge disaster, and they launched very radical reforms. They cut pensions and the salaries uh, by 25%. There were no protests, not at all. And everybody surprised and asked him, how was it possible, how you were able to survive such a crisis, and you know what was the answer? Yeah. So for those who had a crisis, what the crisis? Crisis was once the Russians took our people and they sent it to the Siberia. That was the crisis. Now there are no crises. Well, perhaps that historical note uh, is a good note on which to conclude. It's just been pointed out to me uh, that Dr. Sanetsky will be dining tonight with the Polish Student Society at Dunster House. I'm sure some of you will be there yeah. who are in the audience. Ah, the venue has been changed too? We are the uh, Charles Hotel. You've got an upgrade, folks. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be at Rialto in the Charles uh, Hotel. What, what a good decision. <laughs> That was, with all due respect to Dunster House.
Uh, we've learned a lot this evening, and we're tremendously grateful to you. We've learned that the PhD probably hasn't been invaluable to you uh, in running your bank and your group, but perhaps all that cave diving came in handy. Certainly, there have been times during the crisis in Europe uh, when cave diving has probably been a pretty good analogy, at least from the vantage point of policymakers. You know, actually, uh, actually, there is a huge link between the cave diving and uh, acting during a crisis. You know what is it? The well, crucial being underwater is kind of a <laughs> precondition of both. <laughs> yes. That's true, but in fact, uh, everything what the extreme cave diving is, is about the managing the risk. Well, <laughs> Dr. Sanetsky, you certainly do manage risk well, and you've also held our attention very well indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Please you. join me. <laughs>